introduces himself. He could do it in any way, right? He could have said, Paul, I'm, I'm, you know, this is, I've studied here, I've traveled here, uh, and, and on and on. And I used to be this, and I used to do this. So he could introduce himself in, in any way. <clears throat> but he chooses Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. So my first question is, how do you introduce yourself? Maybe just quiz yourself. How do you introduce yourself? And I think it's important for us to, to think about this because this how you introduce yourself has a lot to do with where your identity is. So however you introduce so so for example let's say uh, you know it could be somebody who introduces themselves with with maybe some kind of title uh, hello uh, I'm Dr Moore sounds pretty good I'll have to start calling me Dr I'm okay with it huh? even if I'm not I'll, I'll respond maybe like are you talking to me or, or hello uh, I'm Officer Moore sounds pretty good right then you. He'll give me a ticket, please, and so I feel pretty good about that. Or, or hello, I'm uh, Judge Moore. That sounds really good, too. <laughs> you, luckily, you get to vote on those things, so you probably wouldn't vote for me. Uh, I think I would be a fair judge, but I don't know. Or maybe it's uh, credentials, right, at the end. You see, maybe you got an email or something from somebody, and, and uh, they'll say their name and uh, Benjamin Moore, CPA. Or Benjamin Moore, EDS, right? So there's some kind of identification there. Or maybe uh, it's, it's who we belong to. Well, I'm uh, so-and-so, and I'm a daughter or son of so-and-so. And so we associate it with family. <coughs> Or maybe it's, it's who you know, right? You, you, you've seen those people who name drop, right? You could be talking about anybody, and they'll find a way. Oh, yeah, me and Bob. Yeah, me and Bob, we hang out all the time. We go way back, and you're like, Bob who? Uh, you know, Bob Shaw. And so it's like, yeah, me and Bob, we're, we're like this. We're best friends. <coughs> and we were out last week. And, and you're like, where did that come from? The people who, who name drop because their identity is found there. But who do you know? <coughs> who do I know? Or maybe... Maybe it's not even a title, but it's some kind of unofficial vibe that we give off. Like, I'm the boss. You don't tell me what to do. Right? Nobody's guilty of that, right? You don't tell me what to do. You gotta put a little attitude there. Right? You don't tell me what to do. I'm independent. I don't need anybody. So maybe it's not a title, maybe it's not credentials, maybe it's, it's this vibe that you give off that you find, like, this is who I am, this is my identity. So what would you say yours is? What would yours be? You don't have to tell us. Maybe just think about it. Maybe you, maybe you think of the last conversations that you had. And just, and just think, because again, this is important because... This is the, the reason we introduce ourselves or present ourselves that way is because that's where we find our identity. <clears throat> you need to know this because uh, the reality is that we tend to work out of our identity. Or another way to think about it is that we act like who we think we are, right? So whoever we think we are, that's how we're going to act. And I want you to see that Paul begins uh, to, he addresses himself at the very beginning of this letter. He could have done it in anything, in any way, with whatever title or name, however. But he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Paul realized that his main role, his identity was as a servant of Jesus. That's why he, Paul, he, the first thing he says, this is who I am. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. The word servant is mentioned in other, if you look at some other translations, in this translation it says servant, but if you look at other ones, it, it'll say slave. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, or Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And this is huge, right? Again, we can skip this and go, okay, well, good job, Paul. You're just kind of describing who you are. But, but don't forget who Paul is. 
If you've studied, if you've read, you, you remember that Paul was actually Saul. And Saul was quite different than Paul. Saul actually used to be a persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. Paul was the one who went and got, uh, when Stephen was being stoned, Paul said, uh, you know, I'm not going to stone him because I'm not going to get dirty, but <clears throat> give me your coats and I will actually hold your coats. And then he went on to persecute uh, men and women, dragging them to jail because this unholy religion was completely against what he thought. And now Paul actually addresses himself and he says, I am a slave to it. I am a slave to Jesus Christ. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. So this idea of bond servant made me think of, of something. So bond servant, maybe, uh, I don't know what it brings to you, but it just kind of reminds me of Bell Bondsman, right? And, uh, and some of you are well acquainted with what that is, and, and some of you are maybe uh, first name basis, right? It's like, what's up, Joe? Yeah, we'll just talk. I know. Here I am again. But it's this idea of a bail bondsman, somebody who bailed you out, somebody who paid something in your place for you to be uh, uh, get out of jail, for you to be able to get out of jail. And so what I feel that Paul is trying to get across is this, that he's a bond servant because Jesus paid the price that he could not pay to get him out of a sentence that, that he could get out on his own. So he's indebted to Jesus Christ. He's a bond servant of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. So Paul realizes that, that this is who I am. This is my identity. He could have labeled himself anything, but instead he chooses to say, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And and can I say, the servants serve the master because that's who they are. And that's what they do. The servants do what they do. Servants serve. Servants serve their master. And so Paul did that. And I think, unfortunately for us, that the reason that the church is not as effective as it should be, look at Acts. I love reading Acts because you see the Acts and it's just, it's just doing some un, unreal, crazy, amazing things. When the church is birthed, as, as the Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit falls on these believers and, and people are getting saved left and right and, and people are just astonished and the, the community around them can't understand what's going on. They love them because maybe they don't completely believe in Jesus, but they see what they're doing and they can't help but, but love them. It says they were all astonished at what they were doing. And we see the church just being this mighty force. And my question then is like, why not? And I think one reason is because of this. Because we do not label ourselves like Paul did. I think a lot of us don't see ourselves as the servants of the king. I think a lot of us see ourselves as, as just uh, listening to somebody who, who gives us a command. And it's an option. Right, when the scripture tells us to do something, it says you need to do this. We're like, oh, oh, that's just an option. Kind of like stop signs, right? They're like uh, pause signs is really what they're on. <laughs> I didn't say stop. I just slow down and then keep going, right? And so we, it's a command, but we think it's optional. And so we don't follow through with what God tells us to do. Instead, we think it's for our neighbor, right? We're like, uh, oh yeah, all the, all the commands about being blessed and, and peace and, and grace and all those good things, those are for me and, I, and I'm going to follow through with those. But the ones that say, you know, sacrifice and, and pick up your cross and, and you should, you know, give generously, you're like, hey, they're, they're talking to you. <laughs> we look at our neighbor like, that's for you. You need to be listening because he's speaking to you right now. Right? And so we, we look at the commands and we see them as options. We choose which ones are, are we're comfortable doing and which ones are for somebody else. But servants do what the master tells them what to do. Servants do what the master says to do. And, and I don't want to miss something here because let's not forget who we serve. Right? This, this idea of slave and servant can have kind of a negative tone to it. But, but let's not forget who we serve. One of the things as I was studying said that, that one way to look at this is, is if you're a uh, soldier in an army. 
And a servant or a bond servant can be like that, serve, that soldier who serves for the king. And so this is a mighty king we serve. This is a great and noble king that we serve. This is a good king we serve. So as you serve, you're serving him. You're serving a God who is good. You're ser serving somebody who's worthy of your service. He is King Jesus, our Lord. Paul knew where his, his identity was found. It was found in Jesus Christ. And so as a servant of the king, he served with all he had. And if you uh, read through it, you understand that Paul served until he actually gave his life. He was in shipwrecks. He was beaten. He starved. He was betrayed. He, he traveled. He worked. Worked hard. Was in prison several times. Shackled. He served with all he had because he understood, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. So where's your identity? This is huge. Paul is a servant. What would you say? How would you introduce yourself? It makes a huge difference. So then Paul goes on to say, he says, call to be an apostle. And again, let's, let's, not, let's just stop there because it's easy again just to keep, keep reading. But, but he says, I'm called to be an apostle. An apostle meaning an ambassador or a messenger commissioned to carry out the instructions of a commissioning agent. Paul says, I'm, I'm an apostle. Paul had a calling. And he was proud and excited about it. Paul had a calling. He was proud and excited about it. He, 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 it meant something to him. He would have put it on here again. He could have put anything he wanted. But Paul chose to say, you know what? I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. And not, not only am I an apostle, but I'm called to be an apostle. It's not like I stumbled on this thing. It's not like it happened by accident. It's not like I was just walking somewhere and, and accidentally it's like, oh, I guess I'm an apostle. He says, I'm called. It's not accidental. It, uh, he knew that Jesus had called him on purpose, for a purpose, and so he embraced it, called him. It's not accidental. It's not like God, you know, he picks up the, the phone to, to heaven and, and God's like, oh, 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 well, I still looking for Peter. Uh, is it Paul? Uh, okay, well, I guess since you answered Paul, then I guess you're an apostle. Paul said, no, God called me. God knew who was called. God knew who I was. God knew where I came from. And he called me to be an apostle. Paul had a calling. He embraced it. It wasn't a random thing. So don't take your calling for granted. Don't envy somebody else's calling either. Enjoy your calling. Gain authority from it. Bless others and speak into their lives. You have a calling. You have a calling. God specifically is calling you. Not your neighbor. Not the one on the other side, not the one behind you. God is calling you. He has a specific purpose for you. And you shouldn't be envying what somebody else is thinking, well, if I, if I had that calling, if I was called to that, if I did that, if, if God had called me to do that, then I could be effective. And some of you are being mediocre in what God has called you to do because you keep looking at somebody else. And God is saying, He has called you. Embrace it. Bless people. You will bless people when you do what God has called you to do. When you live in power in what God has called you to do, when you say, I am called to be this, then you can bless people in it because God will empower you to do what he's called you to do. You have a specific call. But all who have trusted in Jesus as their Savior have been called also to be a representative. See, you are an ambassador for the king. You are a representation of the king in a foreign land. People can't see the king. Normally when an ambassador goes out, the king stays. The king stays in his palace. The king stays where he is, and he sends somebody to represent him. You are that representation. People can't see Jesus. People can't see God, but they can see you. So what kind of image are you giving up? Take a moment to think about it. What would they say about your king? What would they say about the king that we serve? And I'll be honest, if you guys are going to be transparent, I guess I will. But some days they might say, man, that's a horrible king. I don't want to serve. If, 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 if your king is anything like you, well, mm, good luck with that. I'm choosing something else. Because I could be Somebody you don't want to be around. But when I, when I let God 
control me, when I let the Spirit work in me, then people can say, man, that is a good king. If God can do something with him, then God can do something with me. If God can love him, then God can love me. What kind of representation are you giving? What kind of ambassador are you being? What image are you putting on this place? See, God wanted me to tell somebody this morning that, that you are not here by chance. You have been called. God has specifically called you by name. And God says, I need you to do something for me. And, it, and, and he's given you a specific calling, but can I tell you that you also have the same calling that everybody else has? The same calling that I have, the calling to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then out of that, that you love somebody else. Out of that, you say, Jesus loved me enough, and I'm going to love him back, and because of that, I can love somebody else. God has called you to be an ambassador for the king. You are an ambassador. You've been called. Paul was called to be an apostle. You have been called. Then Paul goes on to say that he's been set apart for the gospel. Set apart for the gospel which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power. According to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I tell you that the gospel is not an afterthought. The gospel is not something that God said, oh, Adam and Eve really messed up, so here's the gospel. Oh, all those people in Noah's time really messed up, so here's the gospel. Oh, this church in, in 2017 is really messed up, so here's the gospel. The gospel is not an afterthought. The gospel is what God has been working on from the beginning. It was plan A. It will always be plan A. And when Jesus was on the cross, everybody might have thought, man, this was it. This plan failed. Let's move on to plan B. But that was plan A. All through the Old Testament, it was the gospel. All through the New Testament, it's the gospel. Today, it is the gospel. It is not an afterthought. This is what God has been planning. It's what's been unfolding through all the scriptures. Before and through the prophets in the scripture, this is what God has been trying to say for all along. Set apart. And, and can I point something out? Can I, can I just tell you that all I'm doing is reading the scripture and allowing God to speak to me? Can you guys see that? I want you to see that because you need to be in the word. Somebody needs to hear that today. You need to be in the word. If you really believe that this is the gospel, that this is the hope of the world, that this is why you are here today, that you are a Christian, that you believe in Jesus, can I tell you that this, that you need to be in the word? God, this, God spoke to me in this when I was in my office in my house. I'm just reading this, praying to me this, and God speaks to me. And guess what? You can do the same. You need to be in the gospel. You need to be reading your word. This is, this is what we live by. This is our blood life. If you're not in this, then you are dying. You need to be in the word. You need to be praying. And so this gospel is about Jesus. This, this gospel is not about anything else but other than Jesus. See, let's, let's look at this word set apart. Paul says set apart. So let's not skip, skip over it. So as this, this word set apart means to designate, to mark out by fixed limits, to bound as a field that denotes those who are separated or called out from the common mass. And so, so I want to take you somewhere, okay? This, these are just crazy ways that I, I try to find out how to represent this, but... Y'all with me? Y'all will follow me? Okay, so here it is. Here we're going. Imagine, you can even close your eyes if you want to. Imagine that you have just been dropped off on an island. Okay? Can everybody see the nice white sand, sandy beaches? Everybody see that? I'm seeing it. You seeing it? Nobody seeing it? You gotta use your magic a little harder. Okay? White sandy beach, maybe some palm trees. It's kind of hot, but not too hot, right? It's just right. Nice little breeze. Okay, so you've been dropped off on this island. You're surrounded by water. Obviously, you have to survive. And to survive, you need food. And so what you realize is that the only thing that you really have to live on is fish. Right? That's all you got. You got fish. You got to eat fish. 
You've got to survive on fishing. So you're surrounded by water and fishing. You need food to survive, and the only food that you have is fish, so you eat fish. Now, you can't help but be about the fish, right? That's what you have. You love fish. You're thankful for the fish. The fish sustains you. There's no other thing, right? Fish. I love fish. What's on the menu today? Fish. But I love fish. Even if I'm tired, I love fish because that's all I have. Now, if somebody else gets dropped on the island, you're going to give them fish. Because that's all you have. You're going to say, you need to survive. Are you hungry? What's on the menu? Fish. That's all I've got. But I'm thankful for it. I love it. That's what sustains me. That's, that's what I'm surrounded by, is fish. So Paul is saying that he, he has called you he, and there's a purpose, I'm coming back to it. He, he has chosen you and hidden you in Christ so that you are surrounded by Christ. So how could you be about anything else? See, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, you can go back and look at it if you want. He says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And so much like you have been dropped off in this island in the middle of nowhere and all you're surrounded by is water and fish. You have essentially been dropped off, hidden is what he says, in God. So God is the island you've been dropped off in God, in Jesus, and all you're surrounded by is Jesus. So how could you be about anything else? When somebody else comes on, how could you offer them anything else but Jesus? Because that's all that's around you. Just like if you were on this island, all you could be about is the fish, to survive, to thrive. That's the same way as Christians who've been dropped off. You are hidden. You are inside of Christ. So how can you be about anything else? For Christians, the gospel is not just a one-time thing. It's not just there to save you. The gospel is what saves you, but it's also what will bring you through. See, a lot of times we just hold the gospel out there. We've got to take the gospel, and we've got to preach the gospel, but then we forget about the gospel. But the gospel is what sustains you. As the gospel, yes, it is what saves you, but, but guess what? Monday, I need the gospel. Right? Amen? Monday. Tomorrow's Monday. I'm sorry. You're going to need the gospel. Tuesday, I need the gospel. Tuesday about 2 o'clock, I need the gospel. Wednesday, I need the gospel. Thursday, I need the gospel. Friday, I need the gospel. Saturday, I need the gospel. As Christians, we should live, eat, breathe the gospel, and not just any gospel, but the gospel of God. Paul could have left it out and said it, set apart for the gospel and left it up for you to guess, but he wants you to know that this is not just sub gospel. This is the gospel of God. That's what you should be about. And so let me ask you, what's your gospel about? Sometimes it's, it's kind of hard for me to tell what churches or Christians are about because, because, because I can't see what their gospel is about. It is, is your gospel, is it a gospel of, of suits and ties? Is it a, a gospel of, of KJV only? Not that I have anything against that. But is, it, is that what it is? Is that what you're going to put on your sign? Oh, only KJV. Not that there's a problem again, but, but I'd rather put on the sign, this, is, this church is about Jesus. Because that's, that's, that's all I can be about. Yes, maybe KJV is good, but, but is, it, is it Jesus? The words on that Bible are about Jesus, so I'd rather put something that says, this is about Jesus. Is your gospel about the Holy Spirit? Is it about sticking with the 30s and 70s and the traditions? Is, is your gospel about football? Is your gospel about politics? See, I hear people talking more about football and politics than I do Jesus. Can they see what your gospel is about? People talk about politics all the time, but Guess what? The president's not in control. God is. God's in control. But, but a lot of times we, we talk and we live and, and, and we have these conversations, heated conversations at that about, about presidency and who's in control. And is your gospel about politics? Is politics the hope for this world? The answer is no. It's the gospel. It's the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ who came to, and gave his life for this world. That is the gospel. But sometimes it's hard to see because we're constantly talking about the president, this, the president, that. And can I, can I remind you that, that you should be respectful towards your president? 
The last president should have been President Barack Obama. This president should be President Donald Trump because, because it, it has nothing to do with them. God placed them, and then he says to respect them. Read it. It's there. And he says to respect whoever is in authority. But then he also says, guess who's in control? I am. I, I control everything. It's like shifting water, he says. And he can do whatever he wants with it. So what's your politics about? gospel is about Jesus. Your gospel should be about Jesus. You should live, eat, and breathe the gospel. Paul says that, that he's been set apart for the gospel that belongs to God, and that gospel is about his son. So question, church, are we a church about the gospel according to God or a gospel according to me? Could you give me a clear answer? Somebody who doesn't know this church, what, would, what do you think they would say? Are we about a gospel according to God or a gospel according to me? How I think it should, should be. What I think would, will make the world better or save this world. Paul says the gospel of God. The church is the hope of the world. I truly believe in the church. I want to invest my life in this church, and you should too. You should be able to want to pour out your life in this church. You want, should want to pour out your energies, your money, everything you have, your talents, into this church because the church of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not withstand it. Jesus loves this church. Jesus gave his life for this church, and you should too. It is the hope of the world. Because it carries the good news about the Son of God who was born into humanity, but then he revealed himself to God and proved it by coming out of the grave on the third day. And we can't be about anything else. The hope is in the gospel because the gospel is about him. I'm just reading scripture, guys. I want you to see this. I really want to drive this home because you need to be getting in your word because that's all I'm, I'm, I'm just digging out what, what the scripture says. Paul is telling us plain and simple. This is the gospel. It was told beforehand. This is what was said through the prophets. God has been constantly telling through the scriptures that you have, through the prophets that came in the Old Testament, that concerning his son, this is what it's about. It's all about Jesus. If, if Paul is saying that God is saying it's concerning his son, you better believe it's concerning Jesus who was descended from David according to the flesh. Jesus Christ came as a human being. He was born physically to this earth. A birth just like yours. He was born into this flesh and bone. But then, this same Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of Holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. See, I know it's hard and it shouldn't be hard because we believe in an almighty God, but this same Jesus who came in the flesh was resurrected from the dead. If somebody could disprove the resurrection, guess, guess what? They would. They would. But nobody's done it. You know why? Because that's true. When Scripture says resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. You can go and you can maybe find the tomb. I don't know. But that tomb is empty. They could never disprove. That's why this gospel is so powerful. Nobody in this world has been able to resurrect on their own power from the grave. Some resurrected, but it's because of Jesus, because he's got resurrection power. That's why this gospel is so key. Can I tell you, this is why you need to be about the gospel. It's the only thing that has power. The gospel of football does not have power. The gospel of politics does not have power. The gospel about, of me does not have power. This is why we need to be about the gospel because that's the only one that has resurrection power. You need to be about the gospel, church. What gospel are we about? Paul tells us, you've been saved. God has put a circle around you. He has put a circle around each one of you and set you apart for something. Not what you want to do. I'm sorry. You are not your own. That's what Paul said. You have died. You are alive in Christ. He owns you. He controls you. You should follow what he says. What commands are you ignoring? Can I ask? Think about it. What are you disobeying? He has put a circle. He's separated you. Set you apart for something. And you should be obeying that. 
The hope is in the gospel because the gospel is about him. Our last point, I'm going to finish. The next slide, Scott, yeah. oh, please, thank you. Verse 5. Through him, when we have received grace, an apostle said to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so Paul tries to get even deeper into this calling. He said, yes, I've been called to be a servant. Yes, I've, I've been set apart and called to be a, a, an apostle. But, but it's more specific than that. And, and can I say we? Right? He said, through whom we? He didn't put that there just for any reason. We, church, we. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Paul received grace and apostleship to call the Gentiles into faith. And, and, and I don't know if, if this is you, but I know some people are. When, when we see this, this word Gentiles, say Gentiles. 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 Say it one more time, Gentiles. Gentiles. We, we can look at that word and go, oh, well, thank God he saved those Gentiles. Man, God is merciful that he saved those Gentiles. But can, but can I tell you that those Gentiles, those the Gentiles is us Gentiles? You're a Gentile. I don't know if you know that. You're a Gentile. The person beside you is a Gentile. The one behind you is a Gentile. We are a, a church full of Gentiles. And you, now you begin to see why this letter is so relevant to us. Because we are a uh, this was a church full of Gentiles. This is a church full of Gentiles. And Paul is beginning to speak to those Gentiles. And so we can, we can kind of look, oh, well, thank God he saved those Gentiles. But the reality is that we are those Gentiles. And I don't want you to miss this out. You and I were not part of the family of God. You and I were not part of the family of God. We were separated. We were apart. We cannot get to this grace. But God in his mercy... It gave us the, people like Paul and many others to take the gospel to foreigners and all those who were excluded from access to his grace. You and I are the ones pictured here as aliens and foreigners receiving mercy. You and I were separated. The gospel, the good news was for Jews. That was the chosen people. They were the ones that, that is Israel. Those, they were the ones that received the promise from God. That Abraham was the one who received the prophet. His descendants were the Jewish people. Not us. We were on the sidelines going, I wish I could have access to that God. I wish I could have access to the God. But, but we as Gentiles did not obey the Jewish laws. And so we were excluded. So we're standing on the outside. No hope. And then Paul comes in with this amazing letter, and he speaks to us, the Gentiles. So you might take this statement a little casual, but, but this was a very destructive statement. Gentiles had for a long time been excluded from the Jewish faith because they didn't follow the Jewish law. But I want you to notice the language. Every word is key. He was given grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of God's name among all the nations. All the nations. Again, up to this point, it had only been one nation, the nation of Israel. Now he's saying all nations. What? What are you getting at, Paul? Including you? What? Who? Me? You're talking to me? Who are called to belong? Wow, what a, what a word. You, you're saying that I can belong. Maybe some of you have been to that place where you, you feel like you don't belong. Maybe you're an outcast. And he says, you know what? You belong to Jesus Christ. And to all those in Rome, all you Gentiles who are in Rome, who are loved by God. Love? Did you just really use the word love addressing to me by God and call to be saints? Grace to you. Peace to you from God our Father. And so Paul is using some amazing words that the Gentiles would have been, Paul, you're, really, are you really talking to me, Paul? Are you really saying that I'm, I belong to Jesus, that I can belong to Jesus, that he's offering me grace and peace, that he's not angry at me, that he doesn't want to send me to hell? And Paul is saying, yes, you, all those in Rome, you are loved by God. He wants you to belong to him. He wants you to come into his family. So, and so don't miss that. Because we can look up and go, oh, that's so sweet, Paul. Oh, he's so nice saying all those things. But this was... This, this was just disruptive to what was going on. 
Jews hated Gentiles. Gentiles were less than dogs to the Jews. Jews, if, if bombs would have existed, existed at that point, they would have said, I wish a bomb would fall all over all the Gentiles that they would burn up and disappear. They would have said, this world would be better off without the Gentiles. Gentiles and the Samaritans. Filthy animals, people. It was a hate. It was an evil hate that they had. Not just, a, just kind of one of those angry kind of, no. It was, it was a despise towards those people. And so for Paul to come with this letter, they're going, oh my God, Paul. Wow, Paul. I can't believe you just said that, Paul. This is amazing, Paul. So what I want you to see is that the gospel of Jesus breaks down all barriers for people to come to faith in Jesus, even racial ones. The Gentiles were rejected by the Jews, and so they felt they were rejected by the Jewish God. And Paul tells them the complete opposite. All in Rome, God loves you. So, so church, who, who have we made feel like they don't belong? Who around us? Because God's bringing the nations to us. He is. We're becoming quickly one of the most diverse countries in the world. God is bringing the nations to us. So who have we made feel rejected? And again, if you're an ambassador... You're coming to them and you're, you're an ambassador for God. And if you reject them, their assumption is that God rejects them. So who? Who, church, have we made feel like they don't belong here? Who, who don't belong here? Who have we made feel that way? Who, that they don't deserve grace and peace. That they, they don't deserve love. Who, church? Because Paul says the complete opposite. So how does this apply to us today? Well, I think the church in America has walked along the same lines as the Jewish church did for a long time. It has made some feel rejected. In 1960, Martin Luther King said that the most segregated hour in the United States was Sunday morning at 11. Church time. It's 12 now. But we started at 11. Should it be? Should it be that way? Should, should we, the ones who once upon a time were rejected and outcasts and aliens and foreigners, and God brought us in through his grace and mercy, be the ones now to, to shut our face and turn our backs and go, no, no this, is, no, this is not a church for you. Go somewhere else. Figure it out on your own. Should it be, church? To us who received, because Paul would say no to all in Rome, to everybody, to all nations. For the sake of his name, among all nations, we should be making God's name famous in all the nations. By the things that we do, we should not be excluding some, segregating some. This should be the most anti-segregated time in, 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 in all the world. Because everybody should be able to come together and feel loved and accepted by God. Let me give you some, some statistics that uh, LifeWay Research did. And so here's the questions, and I'll give you the percentage. So it says, my church, this was the question, my church needs to become more ethnically diverse. 53% disagreed. And again, these are church people that were interviewed. Okay, So 53% of them said, no, we disagree. Churches in America are too segregated. 44% of them disagreed. And here's some statistics on whether, because some would want to blame it on the pastors, but the pastors, it says, uh, how many times did you preach about this? About 35%. So several times a year said, 35% uh, and several times a year they preached on this. 20% said at least once a month. And then the last one, and the question is, our church is doing enough to be ethnically diverse, and 67% said agree, in which I disagree. We're not doing enough. From what I can see, I believe that it actually means that we're even segregated on whether we're segregated. Y'all see that? We're segregated on the fire. Yeah, we're segregated. No, we're not segregated. We're even segregated on that. So the question that some might ask, 
at this point is, if the gospel is so powerful as you, if we claim there's power, if we claim there's resurrection power, if we claim that the gospel is power enough to raise a man from the dead, to forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future, to one day that you'll meet God in heaven, right, if you say that's the gospel that you believe in, then why isn't your gospel powerful enough to break the chains of racism and segregation? Instead, it seems like, like we are aiding in the perpetuation uh, of this thing. And here's the sad part, that non, the non-Christian world views as evil. Should it be that the non-Christian world has a lead on this? That they're fighting for this maybe more than we are? Should it be that way? They see this, they, they, they value diversity. They, 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 don't, uh, they want multi-ethnicity. They, they push for these things. Should it be that way? We who were once excluded from the grace of God were brought into the family of God because of His amazing love and now we need to be about bringing all peoples to Him. The church is the hope for the world and the church should be leading the way in matters of reconciliation. And let me make this point that, that the reconciliation is not just racial. Because otherwise, then it could be fixed, you know, with setting up some kind of policy or, or law, and then it all would be fixed. But, but that's not going to fix it. Because uh, racism is, is more than, than an outward thing, it's a heart thing. Racism is in the heart, okay? Racism says, I'm better than you because of what I look like. Racism says, I'm better than you because of where I live. So it's more than this, this outward thing. Racism is a sin thing. Racism is, is a sinful thing. And so to fix that, you can't do that with policies and things like that. There needs to be a reconciliation of man and God. It's not until Paul was recon Saul was reconciled, then he became Paul, and now he became from somebody who was persecuting the Gentiles. You see that? Somebody who, who hated, who was dragging people to jail, to somebody who was willing to give his life for them. It's reconciliation between man and God. And so that's what we should be about, church. How can we reconcile people? And you can't reconcile them if you're not around them. You can't reconcile them to God if you don't speak to them. You can't reconcile them to God if you're not inviting them to church. You can't reconcile them to God if you're not showing them love. You can't reconcile them to God if it's all about you and your priorities and, and how you think things should go in my way or the highway. And then I'm better than you. You will never reconcile anybody like that. Jesus said, you will know, be known by, that you are my disciples by what? Your love. It's a reconciliation of man with God. That's what we should be about, church. And Paul says it here. Because you were once there. You, us, were once separated. But God, in his mercy, grace, and his love, we sang about it. We sang about it. It's not, and that is an all-inclusive message for anybody who will. 